no, we've, um, we've seen on the news um, things happen in different parts of the world, and uh, I feel that we really ought to bring those things to the Lord uh, in prayer this morning. Um, so let's, uh, let's join together in prayer. I've got a Heavenly Father. We, we simply bring before you the, the needs of all those that have been badly affected by the mudslide in Colombia. Um, for some of us, Lord, that brings back very painful memories. And so, Lord, we ask that you will be with that community that have lost over 250 people so far. Lord, we, we pray that you will not only help them to help one another, but, Lord, give us a compassion as you are people throughout the world to, to be able to offer practical help. And, uh, Lord, we, we pray that the same outpouring of love that was showered on Abavan will be now showered on Colombia. And, Lord, we also pray for the, the people affected by the cyclone in uh, Australia. We pray, Lord, that uh, as they survey the damage and as they consider what comes next, uh, Lord, again, give people who are nearby and people who are far away compassion and love to those they don't know, um, but uh, care for all the same. Lord, we, we are your people, no matter where we were born, no matter what kind of uh, ethnic background we have, no matter what our culture or language is, uh, you have made us all. We can all call you our Father. And so, Lord, we pray that you will give us compassion for one another and help us to do what we can to be of assistance to those in great need. Lord, we pray for ourselves as a country and ourselves as a church that you will help us to look beyond our own self-interest and help us, Lord, to have real love and compassion for those that are all around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, someone once gave me a, a card with a morning prayer on it. It, uh, it reads something like this. Dear Lord, so far I've done all right. I haven't gossiped, haven't lost my temper, haven't been grumpy, greedy, gr- sorry, greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or overindulgent. I'm really glad about that. But in a few minutes, Lord, I'm going to get out of bed. (laughs) And from then on, I'm going to need a lot more help. (laughs) I always try to set my alarm just a a few minutes before I need to get up. Uh, I try to say a short prayer at the beginning of every day before I even get up to uh, clean my teeth or um, comb my beard, <laughs> wash my head, do you know that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, it's, it's not written down, uh, it's a very simple, there's no particular formula to it, but it, uh, every day I pray words to the effect, Lord, help me to follow Jesus today. Help me to be better today than I was yesterday. Help me to do your will. The Christian faith is all about following Jesus. Jesus said, follow me. Now some people follow Cardiff City Football Club. No idea why. (laughs) Uh, Other people follow celebrities on Twitter. I don't even know what that means. But I do know what it means to follow Jesus because Jesus spells it out both in Matthew 16 and in Luke 9. In Luke 9 we read, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit 
their very self. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. To follow Jesus means to take up our cross every day and follow him. A lot of people talk about bearing a cross as if it's a, you know, a particular burden or a particular hardship that has been imposed on them. You know, they say, you know, this is the cross that I have to bear. Uh, and uh, that's not what discipleship is all about. The fact is that life is full of hardships and things we'd rather not have to deal with for everyone. It doesn't really make any difference whether you're a Christian or not. Life is plagued with stuff we'd rather do without. A sickness, our own or somebody else's, financial hardships, career setbacks, broken or damaged relationships, all sorts of things which make life harder for us. And we have no choice about these things. Some stuff are just, is just put on us. You know, we, we have it. We haven't chosen it. It's just there. But when Jesus calls us to follow him and be his disciple, he says that we have a choice. Whoever wants to be my disciple, he says. You know, it's a voluntary choice that we make. And he says that we have to deny them, they have to deny themselves, take up their cross daily, follow Jesus. Now, as we approach Easter, we will be more and more focused on the cross. And the cross for Jesus meant death. When Jesus says that we should take up our cross, this does not necessarily mean that we will face physical death or martyrdom. Uh, it did for Jesus. It's unlikely, always possible, but it's unlikely for us. Taking up our cross may not, be, may not end up with our martyrdom. Uh, it was the Persians who developed the cross as a form of execution. Stakes were driven into the ground, which were used time and time again. The cross was essentially the crossbar, which was uh, carried by the prisoner. In fact, the, the prisoner was often strapped to the crossbar before they even arrived at the place of execution. And then when they got there, they were hoisted up into place. But even, even before Jesus was humiliated by having to carry his cross through the streets of Jerusalem... That was not where he took up the cross. He took up the cross not as a prisoner, but he took up the cross when he was free. Jesus took up his cross when he was in the garden with the soldiers on the way to arrest him, led by Judas Iscariot. For it was in the garden of Gethsemane that Jesus prayed, not my will but your will be done. For Jesus, the physical cross was inevitable. He had to take up his cross. He had to go through that horrible scourging where the skin would be ripped from his back. He had to go through the deep humiliation of carrying his cross through Jerusalem with a soldier leading the way, carrying the charge that was, had been made against him, treason, treason against the Roman Empire, 
Here they say, says the Lord, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. He had to hang there until he was so weakened by his experiences that he was unable to to push himself up enough to expand his lungs to breathe in. And on the cross, Jesus suffocated by the weight of his own physical body and the weight of our, our sins that were upon him, breathed his last. The cross was part of God's plan, not just for Jesus, but for you and for me. When Jesus died on the cross, he took with him all my sins, all the things that I had done wrong. And I sinned not just by doing things I shouldn't have done, but I also sinned when I didn't do things that I should have done. When we do something we shouldn't do, when we don't do something we should do, we sin. There was a day when I got down on my knees. Ah, it was in my bedroom. I, I know this because I was there. And uh, I asked God to forgive me all the sins that I had committed. Uh, I asked Jesus to beca- become my Lord and my Savior, and I pledged myself that I would be a follower of Jesus. And at that moment, a cosmic event took place. God, who exists outside of time and space, saw me on my knees begging for forgiveness. And with the same glance, he saw Jesus hanging on the cross. And all my sins flew across space and time, and became a part of Jesus as he was hanging on the cross. And when Jesus died on the cross, my sins and the consequences of my sins died with him. And now, every morning when I get up, I renew my pledge to follow Jesus. Every day, I confess my sins and ask ask for forgiveness. I don't wait until the morning. I don't wait until the evening when I realize I've done something wrong. I say sorry straight away, keep short accounts with, uh, with God. Every day, I take up my cross and follow Jesus. My cross and your cross is taken up every day we deliberately choose to take our will, which is so important to us, and lay it down. And instead we pick up God's will and say like Jesus, not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Being a disciple means you voluntarily deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow Jesus. It seems so strange to uh, modern ways of thinking that finding purpose and fulfillment in life depends on us willingly laying down our own plans and purposes. But God has a wonderful plan for our lives. And nothing we could come up with can come anywhere close to the plans that he has for us. But the only way that we can make room for God's plans in our lives is by denying ourselves our own plans. The only way in which God's plan can be put into place is if we are willing for ours not to be put into place. No, Jesus said that he came to give us life that is full and meaningful. 
but we can never experience his plans for our lives unless we are willing to lay down, give up our own plans, to submit our will to his will, and lay down our life so that we can live the better and more meaningful life which he has already planned for us. Now, the Greeks held a kind of a notion that the person is a body, a, a soul, and a spirit. But the Bible talks about the complete person. Uh, so when the New Testament writers use the word psyche, it, it's translated into English as, uh, as sometimes life and sometimes soul. Uh, but it, it means the same thing. You know, um, when, when a, a ship sends out an, an SOS message, save out souls, you know, it, it's, um, it, it's not looking for a preacher, it's looking for a lifeboat. You know, it's, it's uh, looking, it's not a case of uh, we, we want to sort of our, uh, some sort of nebulous part of us to be, be saved. We want our bodies to be saved from the, the fear of uh, death by drowning. So, you know, when we talk about the psyche, we talk about the whole person. In Matthew, we are, we are asked, what good it, will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? And in Luke, we are asked a similar question, but it's put a different way. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? We only find our true self when we lay down our own ambitions and desires and instead take up God's ambitions and plans for our lives. He is the one who understands how we were made and what we were made for because he was the one who made us perfectly suited for the plans that he has for us. Uh, now, um, when I was uh, young, I, I, there were a couple of um, careers that I, that I thought was very were very attractive. Um, I wanted to be uh, an engine driver. I lived very near a railway station. You used to spend a lot of time in the signal box. And uh, it was the signal man that uh, pointed out to me that I would never be able to work on the railways because uh, he noticed that I was uh, red, green, colorblind. And apparently that has an implication somewhere <laughs> along the line when it comes to trains and signals and things. Uh, but the same, the same thing applied, um, you know, when, uh, when the RAF came, the careers officer brought the RAF to recruit at our school. You know, again, it was a, a no-go area for me. And um, then there was the, the police, well, not just colorblind, but uh, hard of hearing even as a, uh, when I was in school. So that was, uh, that was no good. But um, our, our personality, our intellect, our physical strength and dexterity, or in the case of some of us, the lack of these things, are all perfectly suited for the purposes for which we were made. Now, when we pursue something other than God's plans for us, we are always going to be disappointed, always frustrated, never fulfilled. It is only as we give ourselves over to God's will that everything that we are, all the skills that we have, our personality, it all fits together so perfectly with the plans that God has for us. The question is, are we willing to accept God's will 
Are we willing to accept God's plans and purposes, which are a, a perfect fit for us? Or do we pursue and keep on pursuing our own plans, which may not actually be more comfortable, but they are our plans, and we are determined to get our own way, whatever the cost to our family, our friendships, and to our very selves. Uh, I don't know about you, but every now and then, maybe once a decade or something like that, it's as if uh, God whispers in our ears. See, see, some of you are not old enough to understand this, so you know, bear with me. But um, you know, these kind of questions come to us, and and the problem with the questions is that they they don't come in a recognizable form. But it's it's a question: What are you doing right now? What are you doing right now? Is this what your life is? All- all about is this what your life is supposed to be all about you know you a chosen career is it still right for you or is there something that you should be doing and you need to get out to the one that you're already in if you are going to be able to pursue the one you should be in you know and at times we, we are very aware of these questions, but at other times it's just that nagging sense of uncertainty which eats away at us. And, uh, and through it all, God is calling us into a new life of discipleship, one we volunteer for, one we are perfectly suited for. For it's a life that fits ideally who we are meant to be. Being a disciple means laying down your own plans and picking up God's plan for your life. Being a disciple means that we choose to follow God's plans every day. It means that we actively pray, asking him to lead us and guide us and put us on the right path, not just once in a lifetime, but every single day. Being his disciple means that we choose to follow Jesus every day. When we take up our cross... We identify ourselves with Jesus. And initially, there are some people who find that highly amusing and maybe even a little annoying. You know, they try to humiliate you for being a Christian. They accuse you of becoming a religious nut or saying that you are the last person that should be religious, you know, and they they start to remind you of some of those things that you did, and uh, they will um, do that, not realizing, of course, that you've been forgiven of all these things. They will home in on anything that is less than perfect, are looking for ways to put you down. Oh, I thought you said you were a Christian, no boy. You know, and uh, they're not realizing that following Jesus is not about being religious or about being perfect. It's all about accepting a new way of life that is more suited to you, a better fit, a full and meaningful life. Uh, yes, we, we all know that sin gets in the way because uh, sin is when we insist on doing what we want to do. It is self-centeredness. It is selfishness. But as a disciple of Jesus, we have had our sins forgiven, and each day we have our sins forgiven because each day we make mistakes and have to uh, apologize for them. Each day we voluntarily lay down our plans and pick up God's plans instead. And each day we choose 
to deny ourselves, take up our cross each day, we follow Jesus. Now, if you know that this is the way of life that makes sense, but you've never actually done it, then maybe today is the day for you to start following Jesus. You know, come and lay down your own plans. Ask forgiveness for all those times you've done your own thing rather than uh, living according to God's plans and purposes. You know, when you think of all the ways in which you've done your own thing and you've hurt others and you've hurt, you've hurt yourself, what have you got to lose? Except for all the hassle and aggravation of just being a square peg in a round hole. You know, when we start following Jesus, take up his plans and purposes, when Jesus said to his disciples, take your yoke upon me for my yoke is easy, he meant it fits comfortably. You know, and uh, just come and take his plans rather than relentlessly pursuing your own that are going nowhere. Following Jesus is a daily thing. And so we all need to do this every day, each one of us. But maybe for you today, this is the first day when you consciously and deliberately say, I want to follow Jesus. I want to say sorry for the past. I want to follow God's plans, not my own. If this is day one for you, then uh, I've got a little booklet here that I want to share with you. And uh, if this is day one, come and join me. I'm going to be sitting on the front row. I guess I'll find a bit of space now in a moment. Um, and, you know, let me pray with you as you say to God, I want to follow Jesus. Let's join together in prayer. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you for all that you've done in our lives. We just want to say thank you for the way in which you've been involved in our lives up to this point. We want to thank you, Lord, for bringing us to this place this morning. And we ask, Lord, that you will continue to lead us, continue to guide us, continue to reveal yourself to us, continue to keep us at the very center of your plans and purposes. And Lord, if there's someone here this morning that needs to say to you, Lord, from this day on, I want to follow Jesus, then Lord, give them the courage to come and say that in front of us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Chris is going to carry on with uh, leading us in worship, but if you want to uh, uh, come and uh, have a... Uh, I'd like to pray for you. If you want to make a commitment, I'll be sitting down the front here, this row, and uh, come and join me, and I have a booklet that I will share with you there. Thank you. <laughs>